Hi everyone, I hope you guys are all well. It's taken a couple of weeks for me to get back to you guys, but it, it's been a really crazy kind of couple of weeks. And because of the book that I've been reading, it has been extremely difficult two weeks to get through with reading. I will say the majority of, of um, the book that I'm here to review I did finish yesterday, but that is because I literally, I just stayed in my house, even though it was a, quite a glorious day, I stayed locked in my house and just focused, didn't have the TV on or anything like that, um, just try and get through the rest of this book, and I'm glad that I did that, because it's over. <laughs> <laughs> Let me put it that way. Um, it's done. I don't have to um, go back there as a word. And that book is The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. This is the um, tie-in cover with, for the TV series, which I will be talking about in a bit. Um, but yes, so the thing about this book, it's not bad. It is just so hard. It is. The subject of it, it's so chilling. It, 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 you feel constantly the weight and the strain of it on you. Um, so it feels like I've, I've slogged through 300 odd pages, but uh, it felt like I was going through like 7,000 pages. It's... <sighs> Okay, let me explain really what it is about. So, Hamley's Tale is set uh, in a dystopian future. We don't know exactly when. And it is a place where North America is being renamed Gilead. I don't, we don't know exactly which part of North America it's set in, but it's Gilead. And a, a system has been put on place, put in place, so I say, a political situation is put in place where women are made into kind of slaves, as it were, uh, hand with their milk called handmaids. And they are able to bear children for um, other women throughout um, Gilead who are of higher status, who are not able to have children. So the, the men of, of those couples are the commanders and the women are, you know, their, their wives. And it's very interesting that um, you have each of them kind of are defined by colours. So the handmaids always wear red. The wives always wear um, like a, a deep blue. Uh, the servants, the female servants and such who uh, you know, because of the, their kind of status and such and their situation um, with not, not, not maybe being able to have children are known as the masters. They wear green. They work in the kitchens, that kind of thing. Uh, and there's econ wives who wear blue and white stripes who kind of do like daily tasks and stuff like that. The handmaids also do daily tasks such as doing shopping and, and that kind of thing. But um so you have all of these different levels of society and the handmaids are specifically there, they're, they're basically her slaves, uh, they are there to uh, be, let's face it, raped um, on a weekly to monthly basis by the commander uh, and bear children, uh, bear a child and then they get moved on to another family and they are stripped of everything, they're stripped of their names even and they, the main character who we follow is called Ofred uh, because the commander in her um, in her house is called Fred so she is literally of him, so of Fred and there's of Glenn, of Charles, you know that kind of thing going forward and her name will change with each house that she goes to we never find out her real name in the book, but uh, fans like to follow um, the concept that her name is June because she talks about um, occasionally refer kind of referring to um, a monthly kind of name. And at in the, in the end of the first chapter, there's a list of names that get stated and the last one is June. Um, but all of those characters whose individual names are stated, we follow their stories along with um, Ofred, but um, the, the character of June doesn't appear. So this is why June is, amongst fans, is um, thought to be her. 
And yeah, it follows first person perspective as she goes through um, going into this household and dealing with what she has to deal with and has lots of flashbacks about her life before she became a handmaid, how she became a handmaid and um, the process of, of birth and being raped um, as this ritual kind of thing. It's, so as you can imagine, it is really, really heavy going subject and even the imagery of the colours they're defined by colours and um how they wear these kind of like white um the handmaids have got these bright red outfits and these white kind of like wimples that just covers their face so they can't really be seen by anyone that 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 image is so striking it's extraordinary um there are um other elements of the world people who don't do as they told uh, handmaids who break the the rules as it were and the punishments that go with that are brutal absolutely brutal so this is why when you go into this it feels like you've been slapped across the face in the very first um very first chapter and you feel really feel the weight and this is kind of in a sense the the way that it's written it's got quite a monotone to it it's like because our fred has been literally stripped of all of her emotions everything um but then again because she, she it's the way that she has to be but then again she's absolutely full of emotions and it's so striking a piece so in ways i found it a delight to read but then in other ways i was like oh god i can't i can't handle this this is why it took me some time to to um to read it so to give you an example i'm just going to read a bit um from about the middle of the book and this is um of fred she's just got back from a shopping trip she's with her friend of Glen, and they were having a conversation and a van pulled up right near them and they thought oh my god it's the secret police you know they they had microphones they heard what we were doing what we were talking about we're going to die kind of thing uh, and instead of um getting them they walked past them and grabbed a man who was nearby uh he was just an ordinary man walking down the road and took him away and he's most likely never coming back so she is she's really quite shocked by what she's just seen so this is her she's back in her room at, at house and um she's you know talking about things and and uh flashbacks so i don't feel like a nap this afternoon there's still too much adrenaline i sit on the window seat looking out through the semi sheer of the curtains white nightgown the window is as open as it goes there's a breeze hot in the sunlight and the white cloth blows across my face from the outside it must look like a canoe a cocoon a spuck face enshrouded like this, only the outlines visible with nose, bandaged mouth, because she's, she's been involved in a situation, um, blind, uh, blind eyes. But I like the sensation, the soft cloth brushing my skin. It's like being in a cloud. They've given me a small electric fan which helps in the humidity. It whirls on the floor in the corner, its blades, enc its blades encased in grill work. If I were Moira, I'd know how to take it apart, reduce it to its cutting edges. I'm no screwdriver, but if I were Moira, I could do it without a screwdriver. I'm not Moira. Forgot to mention, Moira is her oldest friend, um, who she's known for since like she was 17, 18. What would you tell me about the commander if she were here? Probably she'd disapprove. She disapproved of Luke back then. Luke is her husband. Not of Luke, but of the fact that he was married. She said I was poaching on another woman's ground. I said Luke wasn't a fish or a piece of dirt either. He was a human being who could make his own decisions. She said I was rationalising. I said I was in love. She said that was no excuse. Moira is always more logical than I am. I said she didn't have the problem herself anymore since she decided to prefer women, as, and as far as I could see, she had no scruples about steaming them or borrowing them when she felt like it. She said it was different because the balance of power was equal between women, so sex was an even-steven transaction. 
I said, even Stephen was a sexist phrase. If she was going to be like that in any way, that argument was outdated. She said I trivialised the issue and that if I thought it was outdated, I was living with my head in the sand. We said all this in my kitchen, drinking coffee, sitting at, at my kitchen table in the low, intense voices we used for such arguments when we were in our early 20s, a carryover from college. The kitchen was in a run-down apartment in a clapboard house near the river, the kind with three storeys and a rickety outside back staircase. I had the second floor, which meant that I got noise from both above and below, two unwanted stereo displays thumping late into the night. Students, I knew. I was still on my first job, which didn't pay much. I worked at a computer, a, a computer in an insurance company, so the hotel, the hotels with Luke didn't mean only love or even only sex to me. They also meant time off from the cockroaches, the dripping sink, the, the linoleum, that was peeling off the floor in patches, even from my own attempts to brighten things up by sticking posters on the wall and hanging in prints from the windows. I had plants too, though they always got spider mites or died from being unwatered. I would go off with Luke and then neglect them. I said there was more than one way of living with your head in the sand, and that if Moira thought that she could create utopia by sh by shutting herself up in a woman-only enclave, she was sadly mistaken. Men were not just going to go away, I said. You couldn't just ignore them. That's like saying you should go out and catch syphilis merely because it exists, Moira said. Are you calling Luke a social disease, I said. Moira laughed. Listen to her, she said. Shit, we sound like your mother. We both laughed then. And when she left, we hugged each other as usual. There was a time when we didn't hug after she told me that she was gay. And then she said I didn't turn I didn't turn her on, reassuring me, and we'd gone back to it. We could fight and wrangle and name call, but it didn't change anything underneath. She was still my oldest friend. Is. So as you can see, it's kind of... You've got this light and this dark through every single line of this of this book. You can't escape it. You are completely and utterly engulfed in it. And it's so terrifying that when you read this book and you learn about how the system came in and everything and putting women in this place and the, this uh, the status of society, this could really, really happen. Right now, it could happen. And it's terrifying. It's so it, it, it it's it's one of these books that I think every single woman should read. I really honestly do. We were never taught it in school. Why not? I have no idea when you know when you're of that age where it's stuff like this is so important. Um I think every everyone sh every woman at least should read it. Uh as to how I feel now. I am so glad I've done I've done it. I wouldn't read it again. I still feel chilled about it. I cannot I think I need today to really let it out because I finished it earlier this morning. Um it's gonna stay with me for sure. It is bloody hard to get through. Um but I'm glad that I've done it. I really, really am glad I've done it. I, I haven't read any Margaret Atwood previously. I'm not planning to read any more of her books. She is a good writer. She She's really good. The way that she's able to balance um, the dark with the horrifically dark stuff, and sometimes she just really pulls the rug out from under you multiple times in a chapter all the way through, constantly through. It's not just that thing, you know, some writer that will pull the rug out under you right when you get near the end of the book. She doesn't do that. She does it quite periodically through. Um, she doesn't hide away from the from the horror. Uh, the description of childbirth and everything is extraordinary, I have to say. Um, she's extremely graphic. But I'm glad that she is like that with the writing of this book. Because I think you need to be. 
I really do. So I totally and utterly respect and love Margaret Atwood for writing this book, for what it is saying and and everything. But I can't go back to Gilead. It's it. I I, I can't. I can't do it. So when the sequel comes out in, I believe it's September, I'm not going to be buying it. Uh, I I need I need to get away from Gilead, even though there were parts of Gilead which um, were quite nice. So some you know relationships between um, like of Glenn and of Fred and uh, <laughs> various you know flashbacks and um, Moira and such. There are parts where I can't go back. I, I just I can't. Um, it truly is a sledgehammer, but this is. But I've said that before earlier this year, where I felt like I've been hit over the head with a sledgehammer. This one has actually like left me dead. <laughs> it it's not a sledgehammer that I feel happy about. It's one that's really hurt. Um. So yeah, would I recommend it? Yes, I think. As I said, I think all women should read it. Um, the, I, uh, yeah, I, but I would say it's it's hard going. It really, really is hard going. Um, would I read it again? No, I've read it. I've done it. I can't. I, I can't go back to Gilead right now. I really can't. Now the TV series, as I said, this is the tie-in cover with the absolutely glorious Elizabeth Moss um playing of Fred I love the tv series I've watched you know the tv series uh, followed it since it first came out um two years ago the third series starts in June yay so excited um so I'm really looking forward to that I'm kind of glad that I've watched the series before I've read the book which you know sounds a bit strange but I think it's because the tone of it the tone of the series captures the tone of the book beautifully there are changes between the book and the tv series totally you know obvious that was going to happen um and the first series covers the book and then from that point on they've done their their own thing and as i said the sequel to the book doesn't come out until september and apparently the books the the sequel is going to be following um other characters and such so it's not following uh of fred but we have continued to follow of fred throughout the second and then into the third series i absolutely love the tv series it's so well written so well put together the use of music in that that so is one of the best use of music in a tv show that i have seen um it is wonderful wonderful elizabeth moss is extraordinary as of fred but it it's top notch top notch there as i said now that i can see the changes i don't feel upset about the changes that were made in the tv show because i don't think it ruined it it just meant that some characters had different um endings or um the the sequences or events are a, are a bit out um certain conversations are extended that kind of thing but i, I don't feel that it is ruined the book or anything um because it set the tone absolutely beautifully so i would really recommend the tv series and i would recommend the book but it's going to be bloody hard um but yeah, that's all I can think of to say about The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. Um, extraordinary book, but yeah, I'm ready to put this away and just not think about it again. Um, <laughs> but thank you, Margaret Atwood, for writing it because it, it was um, it came out in the 1980s um, and was a huge, huge book at that time. And I think it's still extremely important, extremely relevant to today. And girls everywhere should should definitely read it. Uh, there is, I just remember, there is a film from the 90s um, of it. I haven't seen that. I've only literally seen clips that are available on YouTube. And it seems okay, but not, not, not amazing. Um, I'd much prefer the TV series. Um, so yeah i go for the tv series out of those two but as i said that's just me judging on a few clips versus watching two years <laughs> two clips of a film versus two years of a tv series so there you go 
Um, but yeah, I think that's all I have, can think of to say. So, have you read this book? I'd love to know what you think. You can leave me a comment in the comments box below. Give me a thumbs up, thumbs down, tie it to you, let you decide. And I'll be back shortly to announce what book I'm going to be reading next and showing you some books that I bought recently. All right, guys, bye.